what's up hello my name is Emma and today I'm going to be giving you guys my review of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire by JK Rowling if you did not already know though I'm pretty confident you already do I have been reviewing the entire Harry Potter series throughout my most recent reread my YouTube schedule has kind of pushed me off course with these reviews as I have finished my reread and I am only on review number four but reviews number one through three as well as my initial review of Cursed Child will be linked below but today Today we're going to be reviewing Goblet of Fire, which is going to be a totally spoiler-filled talk, so I'd really recommend going to read Goblet of Fire if you haven't already, so that you can come back and we can discuss it together. For me personally, Goblet of Fire has always been one of the Harry Potter books that I don't look forward to as much as the other ones. Not that it's my least favorite Harry Potter book, I genuinely don't really know what that one would be. Number one, because it's so big. It's like the first huge Harry Potter book there is. Number two, it takes forever to get to Hogwarts. It takes like 100 to 200 pages, which is super, super long long for them not to be at Hogwarts and not for the real plot to have kicked in. So there are just Harry Potter books that I prefer to Goblet of Fire, which is totally normal in a series, but I actually really enjoyed my reread of this one. I feel like over the years I've had this idea in my head that I don't like Goblet of Fire all that much, but as I'm rereading it, I'm enjoying it more, which is really, really great. So I always do really enjoy the Quidditch World Cup scene. There is just so much content packed into those first few scenes of Harry go into the Weasleys, staying at the Weasleys, and then everything that unfolds at the Quidditch World Cup. There's just so much happening. As always, JK Rowling writes fantastic Quidditch scenes every single time. It's just so entertaining and you really feel like you're in the stands. So like, especially like the Quidditch scene moment is really, really great because then of course afterwards we get the whole Death Eaters torturing muggles and shit, which I don't really fucks with. But it's just super fun in the moment to watch these two teams playing Quidditch and to have so many wizards from all over the world come together for this one event. For a brief moment, can we just direct our attention to the fact that there is a legitimate quote, it's just a shape in the sky, says Ron Weasley who shits his pants every time Harry Potter just says Voldemort's name. So I think one of my favorite scenes of Goblet of Fire is when, of course, Mad-Eye Moody turns Malfoy into a ferret. And then Professor McGonagall comes in like, Moody, what are you doing? I'm teaching. Moody, is that a student? Yep. Moody, we never use transfiguration as a punishment. Surely Professor Dumbledore told you that? He might have mentioned it, yes. Classic. So Goblet of Fire is the first book where Harry and Sirius have like an established relationship and they're writing to each other. And I found a lot of significance in Sirius's first letter that I never really interpreted before. Harry is telling Sirius about the Triwizard Tournament and how Moody of past Auror is now the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. So Sirius replies that Dumbledore must be reading the signs with everything that's going on related to Voldemort. And I don't know if it's just me, but I always kind of interpreted it as Dumbledore got Moody to be the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher as a favor the same way Lupin sort of became their teacher like ex order the Phoenix members helping out Dumbledore but it makes much more sense that he would have wanted like a trained experienced wizard there to protect the children well that backfired but I guess he had good intentions so I have to say one thing that has always been a little off putting about Goblet of Fire is the distance between Harry and Ron leading up to the first task because Ron doesn't believe that Harry didn't put his name in the Goblet of Fire and he thinks that Harry is just doing it to stay the center of attention. Now I firmly believe that Ron Weasley gets a worse rep than he really deserves and people in the fandom tend to only focus on his negative traits and he really is a good person but he absolutely was in the wrong in this situation. I totally understand Ron's feelings in this situation. He's always second to Harry. He's always second to everyone in his family. He never really has his own moment to shine and it's just always in somebody's shadow. But I don't really think that justifies him treating Harry so harshly when he really needs his friends more than ever right now. I get it. Teenagers, puberty, hormones, emotions. It makes sense as to why he would respond in that way. But I think Ron Weasley definitely deserves criticism for that first part of this book. So I realized my favorite thing about Goblet of Fire is this is really one of the first times we get to see how truly vulnerable Harry is. In Sorcerer's Stone and Chamber of Secrets, we're exposed to Harry's courage. You know, he goes after the Sorcerer's Stone knowing he could face death with Voldemort. He goes into the Chamber of Secrets knowing that he's going to face an ancient basilisk in order to save Ginny. In Prisoner of Azkaban, again, we see Harry's courage, but we also see that he's a capable and competent 
wizard because he's able to fully execute a Patronus, which is an advanced spell that even grown wizards have trouble with. And of course in Goblet of Fire, we see Harry's courage. Obviously there's a recurring theme here, but we do really see that Harry is just a teenager. He's a child and he cannot do everything himself. Harry never would have completed the first or second task without the help of Moody and Cedric and Harry and Dobby. He had to rely so heavily on others in this book and I think that is so important for us to see. Harry's accomplishments will always outweigh his weaknesses and he will always be recognized for the great feats he has conquered as opposed to the places where he had more trouble. But it's still crucial that we see that and I think what is really overlooked in the Harry Potter series is that we didn't just grow up with the chosen one, we grew up with a real teenager that needed help and that relied on his friends and others. And that's just, it's like warming for me to see. Like I like having like well-rounded characters and I feel like Goblet of Fire is where we really work on Carrie's development. So while writing Goblet of Fire, this thought struck me and I know that this is something that has already been discussed online. This isn't like an original thought or anything, but I do wanna talk about it. And it's my theory on why Snape hates Hermione so much. For this part, I have to talk about Deathly Hallows spoilers because it just wouldn't fit into my Deathly Hallows discussion. So if you haven't read Deathly Hallows yet, I'm going to hold up my copy of Goblet of Fire and when I put it down, that means you can come back and listen and you won't be spoiled. So we all know that Snape loved Lily and Snape hates Harry because he is the reason that Lily is dead as he is the person that Voldemort marked as his equal, but he also represents James Potter who is the person that took Lily away from him. Now, I don't know if this is canonically confirmed. We do have a conversation between Dumbledore and Snape talking about how Harry is not necessarily the chosen one and it could be a different boy born at the end of July. I like to believe that Snape had become aware of the fact that Neville also had an equal chance to become the chosen one and that's why Snape hates him so much because if Neville was the chosen one Lily would still be alive. But in addition to Harry and Neville the third person that Snape has always treated especially horribly is Hermione. And so I got to thinking in this book what if it's because Hermione reminds him of Lily? Hermione and Lily are both intelligent, talented muggleborns, and honestly, Snape's obsession is so severe, I think that fact alone is enough to make him hate someone because he reminds them of Lily. But additionally, if Hogwarts was coordinating classes the same way they used to when Snape was a student, the Gryffindors and Slytherins would still have classes together, so he would know how Lily acted as a student, and I think there's probably some similarities in the way they answer questions and present themselves in class, and it probably reminds Snape of Lily, and that's why he hates Hermione so much. I don't know, I just got really invested in this theory. It's not originally mine. There was so much discussion about it online, but I personally totally believe in it. So another part of Goblet of Fire that I don't like is the Yule Ball. Even though everyone loves the Yule Ball, the Yule Ball scene makes me very uncomfortable. First of all, the asking process is brutal because everyone is getting turned down. They're waiting until the very last minute to get dates, just whoever is left, and I don't like that. But also at the actual Yule Ball, Harry and Ron don't do anything. Harry is silently pining after Cho, and Ron is very rudely pining after Hermione, and they just treat the Patil sisters so badly, and I just get filled with tension just thinking about it, much less reading it. Again, I really respect Ron Weasley's good traits, and he does deserve to be recognized for them more, but he treats Hermione so badly in this book. Even before the actual Yule Ball scene where Ron is just spewing off all of these ridiculous statements about Hermione and Crumb because he's so jealous, he's constantly doubting her ability to get a date for herself and just the way he treats her is so terrible and it's immensely disappointing. But ultimately, I'm so pleased and proud that Hermione had the courage to stand up for herself. She's obviously deeply hurt by what Ron has said, but she still manages to really hand his ass to him and say, next time there's a dance, pluck up the courage and ask me before somebody else does and not as a last resort. Like, yes, girl, know your worth. I love Hermione so much. So I've discussed that I have a newfound love for Rubius Hagrid in this reread and the Yule Ball scene with Hagrid really crushed me. I'm not being dramatic when I say this, but I was being really dramatic at the moment. I'm walking through the mall by myself, listening to the audiobook in the scene, and I'm crying in public because my heart just goes out to Hagrid so much. It's the scene where Hagrid is talking to Madame Maxine and he opens up for the first time about being half giant and really resonating with her and wanting to talk to her more about it because he's never had anyone and he says, I've never met another one. My heart just burst. I love Hagrid so much and that Rita Skeeter article 
boils my blood. Hagrid is just so devastated that this secret he's been trying to hold all of his life has finally been released to the public and he's getting so much hate and people are treating him so badly and he doesn't deserve it. I do really like that little meeting at Hagrid's house where it's like the gang and Hagrid and Dumbledore and Dumbledore is just so kind to Hagrid and he's like no, Hagrid, we're not throwing you out. We still want you to be a teacher here. We still want you to be our gameskeeper. Like, he he makes Hagrid feel wanted, and that's not something Hagrid really has had in his life, and that is just so wonderful to me. I have my issues with Elvis Dumbledore, and we're gonna start talking about them in the next review, which I'm really excited for. But as we see him, for the most part, during Harry's years at Hogwarts, he is a just kind and fair person and he deserves to be recognized for that. Particularly in this scene, he is just so compassionate and it really is representative of his good qualities and it's just a really heartwarming moment. Speaking of with this scene, just like every single Harry Potter book, the humor gets better, but particularly with Harry and Dumbledore. <laughs> so in this scene, Harry says something along the lines of that skitter cow. Sorry, Professor. And Dumbledore replies with, I have gone temporarily deaf, but you know in his head he's like, preach, baby. But then it happens again later in the story during his final exam, and Harry is telling him about the dream that he had, and so he says, I fell asleep in divination, and there's a pause, and Dumbledore is just like, quite understandable. <laughs> Another scene that I like really honed in on this review, and it is something that I've recognized in the past, but especially in this day and age, it has really, really hit me. It's when Harry's in the pensieve and Dumbledore goes in with him and they're in the trials following Voldemort's downfall. And Ludo Bagman is on the stand after he allegedly spread information to Death Eaters. So Ludo Bagman has committed a crime and he gets off because he is an athlete. Literally in the courtroom, the jury is like, we would like to congratulate Mr. Bagman on playing so well this past weekend. And he's literally on trial. Harry Potter truly reflects some of society's most disgusting issues and it gets super underappreciated for that fact. So we're gonna skip to the climax of this story. I feel like there's just not much to say about the tasks in this book because like, they're all exciting, they're all suspenseful, they're all really well-written, interesting scenes, but there's just not much to say other than that, I think. So after Cedric has died, which honestly, I forgot how quickly it happens in the story. Literally, they arrive at the graveyard and two seconds later, he's dead, which is very disappointing. But Voldemort has officially risen again. And what I love about this scene is that Harry feels genuine fear. Just like I said before, how we're exposed to his vulnerability, which is often overlooked, I think we could list out a ton of words related to Harry Potter and it would be quite a while before we got too afraid, but it is so important to me that we got to see this. Harry is just so terrified in this moment. Like, he is wishing for the muggle cops to show up, knowing that they'd be even more helpless than him just because he is so scared. And that sort of vulnerability is what I love. Also in this scene, Harry Potter speaks to his mother and father for the first real time in his life, and this scene just is never recognized. It's no longer vague memories or old photos that aren't his, it's just, it's a really significant moment and I truly value it. So nearing the end of the story, we find out that Mad-Eye Moody is actually Barty Crouch using the Polyjuice Potion, and I have to say, I am so pleased that after two years of knowing of its existence, we're finally exposed to its major issues that it causes in wizarding society. This is such a broad, unrestricted form of magic in this world, and the only time we've ever been exposed to it is when it is being used for good. So I'm so pleased that we finally get to see it doing some evil and actually causing some destruction. If three 12 year olds can gain access to the potion and brew it successfully, we've got some major problems here. So it was just really nice that after all of this time, we're able to see the real consequences of it having no limitations and like that actually being recognized as opposed to being swept under the rug and not being addressed. You know, good fantasy storytelling is not just creating a good magic system, but it's also exposing the flaws and limitations of that system and that's what Goblet of Fire does really well. One thing I have been strangely wondering throughout childhood is what happens if you take the Polyjuice Potion to transform into a pregnant person? Do you just take on the appearance of a pregnant person? Do you actually have a child inside of you 
what happens to the baby when you transform back into yourself, if that's the case. So many questions! And I feel like Goblet of Fire actually explains this, or maybe not like the exact situation of turning into a pregnant person, but just questions about the transformation in general that aren't answered when it's first introduced. So Barty Crouch Jr. explained that his mother was dying and her dying wish was that her son would be free again. So they did a little switcheroni using the Polyjuice Potion where Barty Crouch's mother would be disguised as him and she would die in Azkaban and he would be taken out of Azkaban and able to live as a free man, or that's what she- And so after taking the Polyjuice Potion, it says the Dementors sensed one healthy and one ill person entering Azkaban and one healthy and one ill person leaving Azkaban. So if Barty Crouch Jr. takes on whatever ailment that his mother was suffering from in order to leave Azkaban, that confirms that you don't just take on somebody's appearance, you take on their entire biology. So with that knowledge, it seems reasonable that if you take the Polyjuice Potion with the hair of somebody who's pregnant, you become pregnant yourself. I feel like 10 years of curiosity have just been lifted off of my shoulders. So the very last thing I want to talk about in my Goblet of Fire review is the fact that the Dementors kiss Barty Crouch Jr. before he is able to testify. I feel like this fact is also very overlooked because even myself who has just read Goblet of Fire after I reread it, I still was like, I wonder what happened to Barty Crouch. I mean, he was revealed to be working for Voldemort. Clearly he had to have been an ass man and he should have had a role in Deathly Hallows. And like, it completely slipped my mind after rereading it that the Dementors kissed him and he lost his soul and couldn't speak. But this particular scene is so representative of what's going to happen in Order of the Phoenix. And it's really important. So the Minister of Magic feels it necessary to bring a Dementor with him to take Barty Crouch to Azkaban. But the second that the Dementor gets there, he kisses him, which I think was definitely Fudge's plan all along because his first response isn't, I wasn't expecting it, it's, well, it wasn't a loss since he's caused so much death anyways. This is the very first instance of Fudge abusing his power to create a false sense of security concerning the second coming of Voldemort, and that is so freaking important. Okay, I know I have said this is the final thing for the last, like, three things we talked about, but this is really the final thing. Harry giving the twins his prize money. Honestly, like, what a good note to end the book on. Like, obviously, it does not make light of the death of Cedric and the return of Voldemort or anything like that, but within all of that chaos, we have this kind act of Harry where he just wants to give it to the twins so that they can start pursuing their dreams and bring more happiness into the world, and it's just such a sweet moment. Okay, I'm done. That is it for my review of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I had so much fun discussing it with you, and you should definitely leave your thoughts on Goblet of Fire in the comments so we can discuss it even more. I'm really gonna try and bang the rest of these Harry Potter reviews out because I only have three left that I'm really excited to film because these are like the super, super fun ones where we get to get really analytical. I'm so excited for them, but that is it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you soon for a new one. Bye! Yeah.